The Bible without question is the most highly scrutinized book in all of history. It has been examined by and written about countless times. It is also undeniable that language evolves and that we must take that into account, but there is a group of people who hold to the idea that not only the original source material is the direct revelation of God, but a specific translation is. While many of these groups are on the fringes of Christianity on places like Facebook, TikTok, and others, you'll see videos made for, hashtags dedicated to, and live streams discussing the topic of King James Onlyism. The idea that specifically the King James translation into English is the only perfect, infallible, ineffable, and reliable source from which to read scripture. Are they right? Today we will discuss KJV Onlyism, its history, and explore the topic of textual criticism. Let's go! If this is your first time to my channel, welcome. I hope you find this video interesting and edifying. And of course, a like, subscribe, comment, and clicking the notification bell is appreciated. I release shorts every day and videos like this one on Sunday mornings. The King James English translation was commissioned by the Church of England in 1604 and published in 1611. But before we dive into that history, I'd like to define the groups of people who prefer or read the KJV because they're not all the same. First, there are those that prefer the KJV. They appreciate its long-standing tradition, its accuracy, perhaps grew up memorizing from it, but don't claim it to be the only way to read the Bible, nor would they deny the faith of others who read other translations. This video is not addressing this group. There are those who believe that the text used as source material for the KJV, and we will get deeper into this, are the superior source text and prefer translation that come from the sources. These would be called majority text advocates, being that we have the highest numbers of these, although they are not the oldest. This video is also not about this group. There are also those that look at the KJV and modern translations, see some differences, and it makes them uneasy. This video is really not about them either. What we are looking at here are those who not only affirm from a majority text of view, but that a very specific string of events inspired by God led to what is called the received text, and that God inspired specific men from the 1500s up to 1611 to deliver a perfect and inerrant translation, going so far as to claim one cannot even be saved if they're reading from another translation. Some go so far as to say God re-inspired the 1611 King James Bible. This is what we are addressing here. I'll reiterate that if you prefer the King James, it is a fine translation that has served the English-speaking world well for centuries and that it is 100% okay. Please keep reading it and may God bless your studies. All right, let's get into the history of it, shall we? Let's discuss Jerome. In the early 5th century, Jerome set out to provide a fresh translation of the Old Testament into Latin. The previous Latin translation was based on the Greek Septuagint. A Greek translation from the Hebrew. At the time, the Latin-speaking world was using a translation of a translation. When the translation was released, there was near riotous objection to many of the differences, albeit mostly small, between the two Latin translations. Even Augustine wrote Jerome a letter in 405 AD stating he was concerned that in opposition to the Septuagint, they would offend the flock of Christ. While I appreciate Augustine's concern, notice he did not object due to inaccuracy, but unfamiliarity. At the time, the fear of that adjustment recognizing the original text as the inspired source rather than the Septuagint caused a stir. What we will see is that 1100 years later, the cycle occurred again with a man named Desiderius Erasmus. Jerome's Latin translation became known as the Vulgate and by the 16th century was quite literally everyone's Bible. During this time, a scholarly trend became popular by the motto ad fontes, a Latin phrase meaning to the source. At this time, looking at a fresh translation was outright dangerous, but seeing differences already in the Vulgate, even from Jerome's original translation, Erasmus sought further accuracy from the source material. But the Roman church would view such a quest with deep suspicion of potentially tampering with the word of God, largely ignoring Greek because Latin was the language of the church. In their eyes, they'd already excommunicated the Eastern Orthodox churches in 1054, so why use their language? 
So there was already a bias against learning Greek at all, and even more of a bias against learning Hebrew, as anti-Semitism was deeply present in this area. So how could Erasmus safely continue? We will get to that. Uh, Erasmus was a Roman Catholic priest and came across the writing of another named Vala, who never published his discoveries of the differences in Jerome's original work and the current, at the time, Latin Vulgate. Erasmus set out to find as many of the early manuscripts as possible until 1514, but had only found five. In a rush to be the first to provide a side-by-side -side interlinear Greek and Latin New Testament, he dedicated the work to Pope Leo X, the same pope who excommunicated Martin Luther, to avoid a charge against himself. And cleverly, it worked. He published an arguably rushed and somewhat sloppy work called the Novum Instrumentum, the New Instrument, but quickly began working on a second edition to be more thorough. In letters between Erasmus and Martin Dorp, Erasmus is accused of such sloppiness, but responded saying, you must distinguish between scripture, the translation of scripture, and the transmission of both. What will you do with the errors of copyists? This is a profound refutation to those who view the KJV as inerrant or without error, as Erasmus himself affirms that there are errors even here. Also, just as Jerome had faced radical backlash in the 5th century, so did Erasmus in the 16th. I hope that in 100 years we don't see an NIV-onlyist movement or an ESV-onlyist movement. Now, we mentioned in Erasmus's first edition, he had only about five or six texts. In 1519, 1522, 1527, and 1535, he had collected perhaps around 12. We have his notes, and it is truly impressive that he produced such a great translation with so few texts to work with. But which texts did he have? There are four main types, the Alexandrian, originating in Alexandria around the earliest church fathers, Origen, Clement, and later Athanasius, the Western type from the Western regions of Rome, the Byzantine, which is a large amount, albeit a bit later, and Caesarian, which is less common. Alexandrian texts tend to be the oldest and the most concise than the later Byzantine text which contains what is known as expanded piety. That simply means uh, if a text says he, it may be translated as Jesus, or instead of Jesus our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's just expanding the reverence and piety of the text. But it is adding words. There's no real change in meaning when this occurs, but the words themselves do indeed differ. Take a screenshot here, if you'd like, of some of these other examples. This compares the two main groups of Greek texts, the United Bible Society's 4th edition with Nestle Alon 27th edition, representing the oldest known manuscripts, and the majority text in Byzantine. If the great fires of Alexandria hadn't occurred, the majority may well have remained the Alexandrian text, but sadly we just don't know. So that is the beginning point, the work of Erasmus up to his final edition in 1535. It is also fascinating to note regarding Revelation specifically that he borrowed a copy from his friend Reuschlin, uh, which seemed to be of great age. He then had it copied, but the copyist, um, when they copied it, the text had commentary in its margins, and these additional notes were found in no other previous manuscripts on either side of the coin, but they made their way into the text and exist in the KJV even today. Now, one objection that a KJV onlyist would ask is, so do I have to know Greek to know what God said, or are you are limiting God's word only to scholars? This is a non sequitur. An individual's personal knowledge of a language does not affect the translational accuracy of the text itself, only one's ability to personally analyze it. We don't treat history this way. By that standard, without every individual being able to physically confirm it, no history at all would be valid. The question is more about the validity of the sources. However, those who do engage in such endeavors do have the responsibility for this deeper study. Erasmus even critiques Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, asking when reading their commentaries why they didn't just look at the Greek text because many of the texts that they found ambiguous are made much more clear by an understanding of the Greek. KJV only as Dr. Samuel Gipp asked, what should I do if the lexicon disagrees with the KJV? Throw out the lexicon. Think of the implications here. You are placing a translation 
of a source text above the source text itself. Do you see the issue here? That kind of thinking would validate the idea of the telephone game of the Bible and its transmission. Now, I may ruffle some feathers here. The Bible translations are not ineffable. The original copies we have are not ineffable, but they are infallible. We can see copyist errors and expanded piety, but it does not diminish or change the message. We'll talk more about that later. If a KJV only says that their Bible is infallible, they must affirm a couple of things here. That later Stephanus and Basin, and we'll get to them later as well, were inspired by God and produced perfection. That they were providentially guided, yet none of these men ever claimed as such. Remember what we just mentioned regarding Revelation and Erasmus. I mentioned we have Erasmus's notes. Regarding Romans, he states, Whenever a catalog of nouns occur, whether you consult the Greek or Latin exemplars, there are differences. This is due to the forgetfulness of the scribes, for it is difficult to remember these kinds of things. This is important in dealing with variants. Here's an example. In Romans 10, 17, we see whether you say word of God or word of Christ, it is essentially the same in meaning, but Erasmus openly states he is choosing which texts to use. God certainly preserves the meaning of the text here, but not the individual words in the translation, meaning it is not ineffable by Erasmus's own admission. Another claim by KJV Onlyus is that newer translations delete content from the Bible. We've already discussed expanded piety, confirming that words were added to lend reverence in the translation despite the words not actually being in the original source material. But let's look at another example. Here we see in Matthew that Erasmus simply added to the text in Matthew what its parallel in Mark states. Again, it does not alter the meaning since other parts of scripture state it, but if a KJV only cries foul saying, look, they took out half a sentence of Matthew's gospel, no, no, it is simply staying true to the source text, which simply does not have it. It wasn't there in the first place. And these kinds of instances are stated in the footnotes of nearly all modern translations. We need to understand and be aware of such things to be able to explain them to the unbelieving world instead of dividing ourselves over very explainable facets of textual criticism. One of the biggest issues a KJV onlyist will bring up is called the comma Johannium and is found in 1 John 5 7. After the comma, after heaven, there is no Greek manuscript that states what comes next in the KJV. It is only found in the Latin Vulgate. This verse was commonly used to combat Arianism, and Erasmus had to actually defend his position that Arianism can easily be refuted using the vast amount of other text outside of this one and that he himself did not affirm Arianism. Certainly a bigger instance of change here, but even still it doesn't affect the overall message of the text. Even without it, saying what the KJV says, God is still biblically triune. What the KJV states is still absolutely true and orthodox. However, it reflects text that is simply not found in the Greek manuscripts. Now, I mentioned earlier the continuing work of Erasmus through Stephanus and Beza. These three men are responsible for producing what is known as the Textus Receptus, or the received text, the Latin translation on which the KJV is based. Theodore Beza brought about the final form of the Textus Receptus and was the student and successor of the Geneva reformer John Calvin. There are plenty of notable differences between the modern KJV, the 1611 KJV, and the Textus Receptus too. Too many to go into here, but it lends further evidence against the idea of an ineffable translation. So it's really just the tip of the iceberg on this topic. A KJV only can bring example after example after example of supposed changes, but the vast majority are ones we already mentioned here today, either expanded piety, uh, filling in the text from other parts of the Bible, drawing from the Vulgate or Church Fathers. The KJV is certainly not an ineffable translation, nor is any translation for that matter. But that isn't the standard. If the message and meaning is present, rejecting clear and heavy biases or opinions being added to the translations, those who have transmitted the Word of God through the ages have done so faithfully and admirably. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Our God is triune. 
Jesus rose from the dead. The core tenets of Christianity are preserved and correct in the KJV and in modern translations. Let's not divide the body of Christ with these disagreements, but work to build his kingdom, spread the gospel, make disciples, and bring glory to our God and King. Grace and peace.